Good evening, everybody. We are so grateful to Professor Appiah for having accepted our invitation to give this talk today. I welcome you on behalf of NYU Florence's faculty committee on equity, diversity, and inclusion, a committee formed last year um, to talk together about um, these issues, equity, diversity, and inclusion in a particularly unique context, a study abroad site in Italy of an American university with students from NYU's portals in Abu Dhabi, Shanghai, and New York, a university with a presence on six continents, an international faculty, and an even more international student body. This con context is wonderfully rich with complexity, but also contains with it challenges in understanding, in thought, and in our case, in language. La Pietra Dialogues is a forum to connect our students and faculty to the community and the country in which we are hosted. We define our community, as you may notice to this evening, as comprising our immediate NYU Florence community of students and faculty, but also the wider student community of Florence and the broader academic and general public, and of course NYU globally. From its inception in 2008, we have explored migration and race and the community of African Italians which our students encounter, often to their surprise. The community is ever more salient and increasingly of interest to our students um, through the context of the difficult and frequently deadly passage of Africans fleeing war and oppression and economic displacement in their countries of origin. While racism and xenophobia are certainly not new in Europe, the construct of race, in fact, is very much a European export, the debate about European identity and migration and Islamophobia are increasingly virulent. Last October after Brexit, but before America's pivotal election, British Prime Minister Theresa May made a statement, if you're a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. Evidence of rising nationalism and xenophobia in Europe and now more painfully in the United States. Professor Appiah observed in his second Reich lecture on country, today as a wave of right-wing nationalism surges across Europe once more, I think about how fragile liberal pluralism can seem. You started your Reich lecture on Creed with a story of cab drivers asking where you were from. This indeed has become a question we've learned to fear, to shy away from understanding that the question has become, has come to be aggressive in some way, and the answer is never straightforward. But it is indeed a good starting point for our inquiry into identity. The fact that our identities are complex and defy simple description does not mean we're identity less or citizens of nowhere as Prime Minister Theresa May would have us think, but maybe that we are defined by something more than citizenship, more than color, gender identification, or religion. This is the territory we hope Professor Appiah will help us to navigate. I would now like to introduce Noor Akuni, a freshman in the Liberal Studies program of NYU, who has written a recent profile of Professor Appiah on the La Pietra Dialogues blog, in preparation for this talk. Noor. Thank you. So, um, born in London and raised in Ghana, Kwame Anthony Apia um, is a multi multicultural individual who has um, lived through a multitude of experiences. His father was a Ghanaian lawyer and politician, a member of parliament, and ambas an ambassador and president of the Ghana Bar Association. Um, his mother was an English novelist and children's writer who was also active in the social, philanthropic and cultural life of his hometown. As a proud alumni of Cambridge University, he then went on to teach at some of the world's top universities, including Harvard, Yale and Cornell. He has also been a professor of philosophy and law at New York University since 2014. He has delivered multiple talks on diverse topics, such as identity and religion, to various institutions across the globe. 
and has published widely in African American liter literary and cultural studies. Um, he won an award for um, his book In My Father's House, in which he explores the role of African American and African intellectuals in determining and shaping African cultural life. He's also won a, an, an award for um, his book um, Cosmo Cosmopolitanism, oh, sorry, Cosmopolitanism, um, Ethics in a World of Strangers. The question of identity is um, one that generates widespread confusion and conflict. Um, Mr. Opaya chose to tackle this complex notion in um, B BBC Radio 4's uh, Wreath Lectures 2016. Um, the series are divided in four separate talks, um, creed, country, colour and culture. And Mr. Opaya will tell us more about, um, about this topic um, in uh, today's talk. Thank you. Um, we, we did a secret handshake thing earlier, and which revealed to us that uh, her great-grandfather was a great friend of my parents, uh, uh, even though we don't have intersecting ancestries. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. I'm delighted to be here again, and um, this is undoubtedly the grandest room in which I've ever given a talk. Um, so I come from two families, as was mentioned, in two places pretty far apart. Uh, my mother grew up in England. Oh, I should say one more thing, which is that if you've already heard my wreath lectures, this is a sort of summary, so you can snooze and ask questions later. Um, <laughs> so I come from these two families. One, uh, my mother grew up in England, as I say, uh, in a tiny village on the border of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. And when she met my father, he was a Lord's law student from the Gold Coast, which is what the name of Ghana was before it became Ghana. He was an anti-colonial activist, the president of the West African Students Union, and at that point a representative in Britain of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who led Ghana to independence. Later, uh, Dr. Nkrumah locked my father up, but that's a different story. So the other side of my family came from Ghana, more precisely from the region of Ashanti, and my father's lineage could be traced back to a man called Akraman Pim, an 18th century general whose military successes had won him a great tract of land on the edge of the Ashanti kingdom. So uh, I have the following problem. My mother's people trace family through fathers, and my father's people trace family through mothers, so I should have had no family at all. But naturally, I was in fact embraced and absorbed by both. So I want to explore with you today some of the ways in which stories like these shape who and what we are. Your sense of self is shaped by your family, but of course by other affiliations that spread out from there, like nationality, gender, class, race, religion, and so on. And nowadays, we talk of these multitudinous affiliations as matters of identity. And basically what I want to do today is try to challenge briskly some of our assumptions about how identity works. And I'm going to do this by talking about some competing stories of one kind of identity, namely the kind of identity that is supposed to bring a people, in a sense I'll explain, together. So, starting in the 19th century, many peoples who had never controlled a state were engulfed by political movements that sought an alignment between politics and peoplehood. They wanted nation states to express their sense that they already had something important in common. So we need a name for these groups that doesn't imply that they already have a shared political citizenship, and that's what I'm using the word peoples to do. So the, there was, the, in the imagination at least, there was something called the Italian people before there was an Italian state. So a people is a group of human beings united by a common ancestry, real or imagined, whether or not they share a state. In 1830, Hegel wrote, in the existence of a people, the substantial purpose is to be a state and to maintain itself as such. A people without state formation, he said, has no real history. So Hegel thought that as time went on, all the peoples that mattered would gradually become the masters of their own states. And over the next century, that thought took hold around the world. So everyone agrees today that we, are entitled to rule ourselves, but it's often hard to figure out who the we are. The nationalist says, we are a people, we share an ancestry, but so does a family, 
to take the idea at its narrowest, and of course the whole human species at its widest shares its ancestry too. So in seeking nations, where should we draw the line? The people of Ashanti in Ghana, where I grew up, are supposed to share ancestry. But so is the wider world of Akan peoples to which we also belong. There's not just Ashanti, but Achim, Aquapim, Fanti, Baule, and a whole bunch more Akan peoples. So if you were going for a nation state, perhaps Akan would make more sense than Ashanti. Bigger is probably better in modern nations, and there are twice as many Akan as Ashanti. Their homes spread through southern Ghana and Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire. But following that thought, why not go for something even bigger, as the Pan-Africanists suggested? Why not try to create a megastate of all the people of Africa, of African descent? So which should it be? There are no natural boundaries, and that brings us to the first quandary, which is just one of scale, in, in scale in peoplehood. But even once you've picked a scale, not every group wants to build a state together. It is said that the Celts of Brittany, Cornwall, Ireland, and Scotland, and Wales and the Isle of Man, share ancestry. But most of them don't care enough about that fact to want to act together as a people. So they're not a nation. They're not even a nation in formation. So let's posit that a nation is a group of people who think of themselves as sharing ancestry and care about it. Still, how do you know when you care enough to qualify as having a national consciousness? Matching people to territories faces yet a third quandary. I mentioned the Akan, probably never heard of them before this evening. But living side by side with Akan people are people of other ancestries. Guans, for example, whose forebears migrated to Ghana a millennium ago. The logic of shared ancestry offers only three possible answers for such interspersed minorities. You can annihilate them, you can expel them, or you can assimilate them and invent a story of common ancestry to cover up the problem. Every one of these solutions has been tried somewhere in the past couple of hundred years, but none of them would be necessary if you weren't in the business of trying to match states to peoples. Deciding which nation is yours is further complicated when political boundaries keep shifting. In 1900, most of Central and Eastern Europe was ruled by one empire or another, uh, Austro-Hungarian, Russian, uh, Ottoman. After the First World War, independent nation states were delivered, blinking like little babies, into the light. After the Second World War, boundaries shifted again, and in uh, Churchill's famous image, an iron curtain reshaped the map once more. Meanwhile, with the partition of British India in 1947, some 14 million people crossed the new borders between India and Pakistan, Hindus and Sikhs into India, Muslims into Pakistan. And this was at that point the largest migration in human history, even though between 30 and 40 million Muslims remained in India, which by the way, will soon have the largest Muslim population in the world. And with the end of Europe's empires, dozens more independent states in Africa and Asia appeared on the world stage. In Africa, in 1945, only Egypt, Ethiopia, and South Africa were independent states. Today, there are 54 independent states in the African Union. So you peer at this gleaming canvas of countries and you can see that the paint is still wet. It's still very recently made. The global success of nationalist movements is a 20th century phenomenon. The ideology that fueled them is a century or so older. I think many people would find that thought surprising. Human beings have long told stories about clashing tribes, clashing peoples. The Old Testament is filled with the names of peoples. Assyrians, Canaanites, Chaldeans, Cushites, Philistines. Those of you who know your Old Testament could give me a few dozen more. These people do things together, and their actions are the theme of a thousand epic tales. The Assyrians attack Israel. Oh, the Assyrians came down like a wolf on the fold, and their cohorts were gleaming in purples and gold. Uh, the Romans famously conquered the Greeks. These stories generally celebrate their respective peoples as a pretty terrific lot, an in-group well worth belonging to. Shakespeare's Henry V, addresses his soldiers as, you noblest English whose blood is fed from fathers of war proof. 
So why isn't that just nationalism before I said it began? The answer is that something new entered European thought towards the end of the 18th century, many things, but this is one of them. Reacting against the rationalism of the Enlightenment, the deification, as it were, of reason, Romanticism produced a great upswelling of new feelings and ideas, especially in the expanding middle classes. It brought together a fascination with conquering heroes and an engagement with folk traditions that were thought to express a people's true spirit, what German thinkers took to calling the Volksgeist. The Romantic philosopher Johann Gottfried Herder pursued the idea that what made the Germans a people was a spirit, a geist, embodied above all else in their language and literature. He thought this applied to every other people too, every other folk. By the late 19th century, this romantic ideal was a platitude. Ernest Renan, the conservative French historian and patriot, wrote in 1882, a nation is a soul, a spiritual principle. A thousand kilometers southeast of him in Genoa, not so far away, the revolutionary Giuseppe Mazzini announced his nationalist mission by saying he was going to awaken the soul of Italy. But what would it mean to have a national soul to awaken? Would it require a common language? Well, as late as 1893, roughly a quarter of the 30 million citizens of metropolitan France hadn't mastered the French language in the hexagon. Italy, on unification, was filled with mutually unintelligible dialects, and even now recognizes officially some 20 regional dialects, and of course has to accept the existence in this country of other languages like Arabic. How about ethnicity? India and China and Indonesia are wildly diverse in their ethnicities, which doesn't stop the existence of Indian and Chinese and Indonesian nationalism. And this is true whether or not the societies recognize it. And, as you know, the countries of the Americas, including the United States, all, to some degree or other, acknowledge that they have origins in a multiplicity of peoples. Yet, despite all this internal diversity, which really doesn't fit with the idea of a shared geist, these nation-states are somehow holding together. Earlier, I described nation-states emerging from an age of empire in Africa and Asia, in recent decades, many theorists of globalization predicted that the process would reverse itself. The nation state would be demoted, as it were, to middle management, a mere node in a vast transnational flux of capital and labor with banking treaties and trade pacts and all the supranational security arrangements required for transnational adversaries from drug cartels to terrorists, who are two of the major sources of threat to the nation state. So the national age was supposed to be edged aside by the network age. What's everywhere in evidence today are the forces of resistance to that sort of globalization. Boris Johnson, once a joke, but now the British Foreign Secretary, tapped into them when he said that Brexit was, quote, about the right of the people of this country to settle their own destiny. But which people? Was it the British people he was talking about? Well, then the British people denied that right to the Scottish people. So who are we? There was certainly a chauvinist strain in Brexit nationalism, and you'll find more overt hard nationalism elsewhere. Mr. Trump wants to make America great again. It's not entirely clear at whose expense. In India, the ruling party built a following by claiming that only Hindutva, a putative unity of language, region, religion, and culture, can bring the nation together. Mr. Modi has tried to distance himself from that, but it's still very much there in the background of the politics of his party. In Austria, the Freedom Party, the Freiheitliche Partei Österreichs, is held together, they say, by a German heritage. In Hungary, Poland, and elsewhere, ruling parties have made similar avowals. They defend Christian values against Middle Eastern migrants. They denounce the Eurocrats and they extol the purity of the national heritage. And in asserting these nationalisms, they deny religious and ethnic minorities like the Roma an equal place within the nation. Well, in Ghana, we know that won't work. Ghanaians speak about 80 languages in a small country. 
Our religious diversity is all over the map. Accra, our national capital, has one of the largest Nichiren Shoshu Buddhist temples outside of Japan and has a huge new Mormon temple. And Ghanaians live all over the map too. Hundreds of thousands of Ghanaians live in Nigeria, close to 100,000 live in the United States and Britain, and thousands live, tens of thousands in the Netherlands, South Africa, and a host of other countries. Because of this diversity and diffusion, Ghanaians are well aware that they are not a Hadarian people with one history and culture and a single unifying Volksgeist. But that doesn't stop anyone from thinking of themselves as Ghanaian when it comes to election time, or when they travel abroad on Ghanaian passports, or when they are following the Olympics, or more importantly, the World Cup. You do not have to be a shanty to be proud as a Ghanaian of Kofi Annan for his service as Secretary General of the United Nations. And Kente, the fabulous silk fabric woven in Bonwiri near Kumasi, where I grew up, is now worn proudly by Ghanaians around the world who are not from that region of the country. So Ghanaians are slowly becoming a people drawn together over a few decades as the Italians have been over a couple of centuries by living together under a single government. It's this process that matters. Recognize that nations are invented and you'll see that they're always being reinvented. Once to be English, you had to imagine that your ancestors were recorded a millennium ago in the Doomsday Book. Now a Pavel or a Muhammad or even a Kwame can be English. Once the Anglican Church defined Englishness, now an array of creeds can be embodied in the teams that play cricket for England. What really matters, and, and uh, in those teams the uh, Muslim players are often the best, what really matters is making a nation beyond the, sorry, what really matters in making a nation beyond these shared stories, as Ernest Renan also argued, is, and I quote, the clearly expressed desire to continue a common life. A nation's existence, he went on, is, if you will pardon the metaphor, a daily plebiscite, a daily election, a daily vote. What makes us a people, ultimately, is a commitment to governing a common life together. The challenge this poses for liberal democracies is formidable. Liberal states depend upon a civic creed that is both powerful on the one hand and yet lean on the other, potent enough to give significance to citizenship, but lean enough to be shared by people with different religious and ethnic affiliations. The Romantic state could pride itself on being the emanation of one folk with its primordial consciousness, its geist. The liberal state has to get by with a little, a good deal less mysticism. The romantic state could boldly identify itself with a will, capital W, will of the people. Liberal states must content themselves with a general willingness to go along. The romantic state rallies, rallies its, citizens, its citizens with the stirring cry, one people, one destiny, the liberal state's true anthem is, we can work it out. Uh, as I was quoted saying earlier, a wave of populist nationalism that's now surging through Europe can make this kind of pluralism look like a fragile thing. And of course, nations do need something to hold them together. But let the argument not be made in terms of some ancient spirit of the folk. The truth of every modern nation is that political unity is never written, uh, underwritten by some existing national commonality. What binds citizens together is a commitment, through Renan's daily plebiscite, to sharing the life of a modern state, united by its institutions, procedures, and precepts. So I've argued against Herder's soul, collective soul, as a basis for nationality, but a different story, whose roots are also in the 18th century, has returned in recent years, one that is grounded in the national body. At the start of the 18th century, there were certainly peoples, in the sense I defined, that is, groups of shared ancestry, real or imagined, as there have been, of course, as I also said earlier, since the beginnings of recorded history. But no one thought that their unity derived from their physical natures. The idea that each people shared an inherited biological nature had not taken over among European thinkers uh, by, say, 1750. 
Most of them believed in the biblical story of creation, and that meant that every living person was a descendant of Adam and Eve, and everybody was also a descendant of Noah. Since, as you recall, humanity started again after the flood. And the idea of distinguishing between our biological and our non-biological features was still in the intellectual future. When Leibniz wrote about what distinguished one people from another, he thought what mattered was language. Uh, Leibniz kept writing letters to the to the Tsar asking for more information about the languages that were spoken in the Russian Empire because he was fascinated by, by languages. And if you read contemporaneous accounts, contemporaneous that is with uh, Leibniz, by European travelers and the thinkers who read them, the great debates were about the role of climate and geography in shaping color and customs, not about inherited bodily characteristics. Beginning in the mid 18th century, however, a contest developed between the older biblical understanding of the nature of humanity and a newer one that grew with the increasing prestige of the scientific study of humankind. In 1750, almost everyone would have agreed that since all human beings had to be descended from the sons of Noah, the different kinds of people might be different because they descended from Shem or Ham or Japheth, which would give you three races, Semites from Shem, blacks from Ham, and uh, whites from Japheth. But the travels of European scientists and explorers revealed the diversity of modern human beings, which doesn't, of course, fit this framework. Take the absence from the biblical picture of East Asians, like the Chinese, the Japanese, the Koreans, and so on, uh, or of Amerindians. Some thinkers even began to wonder if all the people in the world were really descendants of Adam. Such findings might have encouraged intellectuals to question how deep these divisions of humanity really were. Instead, for the most part, natural historians just sought to expand the categories and continued to ground hierarchies of color in what they thought was the natural order of things. There were notable forces of opposition, to be sure. The Abbe Grégoire, the great French revolutionary Catholic priest and anti-slavery campaigner, published a survey of the cultural achievements of black people in 1808, less than two decades after the storming of the Bastille. Um, it's called De la littérature des nègres. He offered up evidence for the unity of the human race and the fundamental equality of black people. And he sent a copy of his book to Thomas Jefferson, who had remarked in his notes on the state of Virginia that he could never, quote, find a black that had uttered a thought above the level of plain narration. So Grégoire urged Jefferson to think again by giving him a great book of evidence. As Grégoire's activism suggests, the background to the debate about the capacity of the Negro was the explosion of African slavery in Europe's New World colonies in the Americas. In the early 1700s, the transatlantic slave trade was rising to its mid 18th century peak, when nearly 200,000 people a year were transported in shackles from Africa to the New World. Many historians have concluded that one reason for the increasingly negative view of the Negro through the later 18th century was the need to salve the consciences of those who trafficked in and exploited enslaved men and women. As Grégoire himself put it, bleakly but bluntly, people have slandered Negroes first in order to get the right to enslave them, and then to justify themselves from having enslaved them. The slanders against the Negro race may have salved some Christian consciences. They could never, of course, have justified what had been done in enslaving millions of black people. But ideology in, enlisted by forms of domination from slavery to uh, colonization does help explain why at a time when scientists were discarding notions like phlogiston, supposedly the substance of fire, they made extraordinary efforts to hold on to the idea that race was real. There were the physical anthropologists with their craniometric devices measuring skulls. There were the ethnologists and physiologists and the evolutionary theorists who, discounting Darwin, propagated notions of race degeneration and separate polygenic origins for the various races. One illustrious discipline after another was recruited to give content to color. And so in the course of the 19th century, out of noisy debate, the modern race concept took hold. 
Its first premise was that all of us carry within us something that comes from the race to which we belong, something that explains our mental and physical potential. That something, that race, was inherited biologically. If your parents were of the same race, you shared their common essence. Its second premise was that this common essence had profound intrinsic importance, that many of the characteristics of individual human beings were a product of their race. People might be assigned to the Negro race on the basis of their skin, color, and hair, or their thicker lips and broader noses, but these visible differences, though important for the initial classification, were only the beginning of a catalog of deeper differences. The great African-American intellectual W.B. Du Bois, theorist of the color line, insisted that the deeper unities of race are, and I quote, spiritual, psychical, undoubtedly based on the physical, but infinitely transcending them. We might call this idea that almost everything important about people is shaped by their race, conceived of as a shared, heritable, biological property, we might call this the racial fixation. By the late 19th century, in the world of the North Atlantic, the racial fixation was everywhere. Scientists led the way, humanists rushed to keep up. Hippolyte Tan, the great uh, French literary historian writing about English literature, says in the late uh, 19th century, a race like the old Aryans scattered from the Ganges as far as the Hebrides, settled in every clime and every stage of civilization, transformed by 30 centuries of revolutions, nevertheless manifests in its languages, religions, literatures, philosophies, the community of blood and of intellect, which to this day binds its offshoot together. This is in the introduction to a book about a history of English literature. Tan was one of the most influential historians of his era. Literary history had become part of the modern scientific study of race. And so race was a central preoccupation not only of Europe's social and natural scientists, but of its humanists as well. And their thinking was guided by what you might call the typological assumption. Everything, everyone was a representative of a racial type, so each of us provides a window into our race. And the typology of race explains not only our physical, but also our cultural type. The racial assumptions of the 19th century had a moral dimension too. People were supposed to have a preference for, indeed they had special obligations to their own kind. The race concept may have been propelled by imperial dreams of domination, but it was adopted by those who sought to resist domination too. Edward W. Blyden, a founder of Pan-Africanism who was born in the Caribbean but moved to Liberia as a young man, expressed this thought as well as any in a Sierra Leonean newspaper in 1893. Abandoning the sentiment of race, he wrote, is like trying to do away with gravitation. In reality, the history of the world shows that hatred and warfare is as common within the so-called races as it is between them, more common, in fact, since conflict requires contact. There was nothing racial in the 5th century BCE conflicts between China's warring states, or between Ashanti and Dentura in West Africa in the early 18th century, or among the various Amerindian states of Mexico before the arrival of the Spanish. Still, this dialectic with where the idea of race becomes the common currency both of negation and affirmation, both of dominance and resistance, would prove dauntingly difficult to withdraw from, even if it's, as its intellectual foundation started to crumble. So over the past century, with the rise of modern genetics, race and science became untethered from each other. Once you grasped the new theories, you could see that the idea of a racial essence was a mistake. There was no underlying single something that explained why Negroes were Negroes and Caucasians Caucasians. Their shared appearance was the product of genes for appearance, some of which they have in common. And those genes played no role in fixing your tastes in poetry or your philosophical ideas, as Tan imagined. The picture that Tan had presented no longer had a foundation in the biological sciences. There was no longer a theory to support the racial fixation. It also became clear that the vast majority of our genetic material is shared with all human beings, whatever our race, and much of the variation that does exist doesn't correspond to the old racial categories. Almost all the world's uh, genetic variation is found within every one of the major purported racial groups. So every element of the older view was put in doubt. The racial fixation and the typological assumption made sense if there was a racial essence, but if there wasn't, 
then each human being was a bundle of characteristics, and you had to have some other reason for supposing that one African told you anything more about another black person uh, than he told you about a white person with whom he would also share most of his genes. It's true that if you look at enough of a person's genes, you can usually tell whether they have recent ancestry in Africa or Asia or Europe. But that's because there are patterns of genes in human populations, and that's a fact about groups, not because there are particular sets of genes shared by the members of every race, which would be a fact about individuals. And a great many people in the world live at the boundaries of the races imagined by 19th century science. Between African Negroes and European Caucasians, there are Ethiopians and Arabs and Berbers. Between the yellow races of East Asia and the white Europeans are the peoples of Central and South Asia. Where in India is there a sharp boundary between white and brown and black? There is little doubt that changes, that genes make a difference alongside environment in determining things like height and the color of your skin. Some people are cleverer or more musical or better poets than others, and maybe genes play a role there too. But these genes are not inherited in racial packages. And so, if you want to think about the limits of individual human capability and how they are set by our generic inher genetic inheritance, it doesn't help to think about races. Race is something we make. It's not something that makes us. In the world we live in now, race, like the national soul, cannot be used to hold a nation together. So let me turn now, finally, to my third candidate for peoplehood, and that's culture. And here, let me begin by sketching two visions of culture that have been extremely influential in the modern world. In 1871, Edward Burnett Tyler published his masterwork, Primitive Culture, which can lay claim to being the first work of modern anthropology. Primitive Culture was, in some respects, a quarrel with another book that had the word culture in its title, Matthew Arnold's Culture and Anarchy, a collection that had appeared just two years earlier. For Arnold, a poet and literary critic, culture was, quote, the pursuit of our total perfection by means of getting to know on all the matters which most concern us the best which has been thought and said in the world. So Arnold wasn't interested in a class-bound, narrow connoisseurship. He had in mind a moral and aesthetic ideal which found expression in the world's art and literature and music and philosophy. But Tyler thought that the word should mean something quite different, and he was able to make sure that it did, because he became the first professor of anthropology at Oxford University. It's to Tyler more than anyone else that we owe the idea that anthropology is the study of something called culture, which he defined as that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, arts, morals, law, customs, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. Civilization, as Arnold understood it, was merely one of one tiny fraction of the many molds of Tyler's culture. I think nowadays when people speak about culture, it's usually either Tyler's or Arnold's notion that they have in mind. The two concepts of culture are in some ways antagonistic. Arnold's ideal was the man of culture, and he would have considered primitive culture an oxymoron, a contradiction in terms. Tyler thought it absurd to propose that anybody could lack culture. Yet these contrasting notions of culture are locked together in the concept of Western culture, which many think defines the identity of modern North Atlantic societies. We often talk of the Muslim world today, of the Western world today, to contrast it with the Muslim world. Uh, Muslim thinkers, too, sometimes speak in a parallel way, distinguishing between uh, Dar al-Islam, the home of Islam, and Dar al-Kufr, the home of unbelief. European and American debates today about whether Western culture is fundamentally Christian inherit, as we'll see, a genealogy in which Christendom was replaced by Europe and then by the idea of the West. For Herodotus, writing in the fifth century before the Common Era, the world was divided into three parts. To the east was Asia, to the south was a continent he called Libya, Africa, and the rest was Europe. He knew that people and goods and ideas could travel easily between the continents. He himself traveled up the Nile as far as Aswan, and he traveled on both sides of the Hellespont, which is the traditional boundary between Europe and Asia. Herodotus admitted to being puzzled, in fact, as to, quote, why the earth, which is one, has three names, all women's, Europa, uh, Asia, 
Libya. But here's the important point. It wouldn't have occurred to Herodotus to think that these three names corresponded to three kinds of people, Europeans, Asians, and Africans. He himself was born at Halicarnassus, Bodrum in modern Turkey, yet being born in Asia Minor didn't make him an Asian. It left him a Greek. And the Celts in the far west of Europe were much stranger to him than the Persians or the Egyptians, about whom he knew a whole lot. Herodotus only uses the word European as an adjective, never as a noun. And for a millennium after his day, no one else speaks of Europeans as a people either. Then the geography Herodotus knew was radically reshaped by the rise of Islam, which burst out of Arabia in the seventh century, spreading with astonishing rapidity north and east and west. After the death of the prophet in 632 CE, the Arabs managed in a mere 30 years to defeat the Persian Empire that reached through Central Asia as far as India and to wrest provinces from Rome's residue in Byzantium. A century later, most of the Iberian Peninsula was under Muslim rule and not until 1492, nearly 800 years later, was the whole peninsula under Christian sovereignty again. The Muslim conquerors had not planned to stop at the Pyrenees, and they made regular attempts in the early years to move further north. But near Tours in 732, Charles Martel, Charlemagne's grandmother, grandfather, defeated the forces of Al-Andalus, and this decisive battle effectively ended the Arab attempts at the conquest of Frankish Europe. What matters for our purposes is that the first recorded use of a word for Europeans as a noun, as a kind of person, comes, so far as I know, out of this history of conflict. In a Latin chronicle written in 754 in Spain, the author refers to the victors of the Battle of Tours as Europenses, Europeans. So, simply put, the very idea of a European was first used to contrast Christians and Muslims. Starting in the late 14th century, the Turks, who created the Ottoman Empire, gradually extended their rule into parts of Europe, Bulgaria, Greece, the Balkans, and Hungary. Only in 1529, with the defeat of Suleiman the Magnificent's army at Vienna, did the reconquest of Eastern Europe begin. I'm borrowing the, the Spanish word, reconquest, for the re-Christianization. It was a slow process. It wasn't until 1699 that the Ottomans finally lost their Hungarian possessions. Greece became independent only in the early 19th century and Bulgaria even later. So we have then a clear sense of Christian Europe defining itself through opposition. And yet the move from Christendom to Western culture isn't straightforward. For one thing, the educated classes of Christian Europe took many of their ideas from the pagan societies that preceded them. At the end of the 12th century, Chrétien de Troyes, born a couple of hundred kilometers southwest of Paris, celebrated these earlier roots. Greece once had the greatest reputation for chivalry and learning, he wrote. Then chivalry went to Rome, and so did all of learning, and it has now come to France. Now, the idea that the best of the culture of Greece was passed by way of Rome into Western Europe gradually became, in the Middle Ages, a common trope. In fact, it actually has a name. It's called the translatio studii, the transfer of learning. And it was an astonishingly persistent idea. Six centuries later, Hegel, again, told the students of the high school, of which he was the headmaster in Nuremberg, that, quote, the foundation of higher study must be and remain Greek literature in the first place, Roman in the second. So from the late Middle Ages until now, people have thought of the best in the culture of Greece and Rome as a civilizational inheritance passed on like a precious golden nugget dug out of the earth in Greece, transferred when the Roman Empire conquered them to Rome. Shared between the Florentine and Flemish courts and the Venetian Republic and the Renaissance, its fragments passed through cities like Avignon, Paris, Amsterdam, Weimar, Edinburgh, and London, and were finally reunited, pieced together like the broken shards of a Grecian urn in the academies of Europe and the United States, where you study. There are many ways of embellishing the story of the Golden Nugget, but they all face a historical difficulty. If, that is, you want to make the Golden Nugget the core of a civilization opposed to Islam. Because the classical inheritance it identifies was shared with Muslim learning. In Baghdad, in the ninth century Abbasid Caliphate, the palace library featured the works of Plato and Aristotle, Pythagoras and Euclid, translated into Arabic. 
And of course, as the last of the major Abrahamic faiths, Islam combined this attention to the pagan classics with an engagement with the tradition of Judaism and Christianity. In the centuries that Petrarch called the Dark Ages, when Christian Europe made little contribution to the study of Greek classical philosophy, and many of the texts were lost, these works were preserved by Muslim scholars. And much of our modern understanding of classical philosophy among the ancient Greeks uh, comes because the traditions for interpreting these texts were recovered by European scholars in the Renaissance from the Arabs. In the mind of its Christian chroniclers, we saw the Battle of Tours pitted Europeans against Islam. But the Muslims of Al-Andalus, bellicose as they were, did not think that fighting for territory meant that you could not share ideas. By the end of the first millennium, the cities of the Caliphate of Cordoba were marked by the cohabitation of Jews, Christians, and Muslims, of Berbers, Visigoths, Slavs, and countless others. There were no recognized rabbis or Muslim scholars at the court of Charlemagne. In the cities of Al-Andalus, there were Christian bishops and synagogues. Resimondo, Catholic Bishop of Elvara, was ambassador from Muslim Cordoba to the Christian courts of the Byzantine and the Holy Roman Empires. Hazdi ibn Shaprut, leader of Cordoba's Jewish community in the middle of the 10th century, was not only a great medical scholar, he was the chairman of the Caliph's Medical Council. The translation into Latin of the works of Ibn Rushd, born in Cordoba in the 12th century, began the European rediscovery of Aristotle. Ibn Rushd was known in Latin as Averroes, but he was more commonly just called the commentator because of his commentaries on Aristotle. So the classical traditions that are meant to distinguish Western civilization from the inheritance of the caliphates are actually a point of kinship with them. So the golden nugget story fragments. It imagines Western culture as the expression of an essence or something which has been passed from hand to hand on some historic journey. And we've seen the pitfalls of that kind of essentialism already. We began with the essential nation, bound together by language and custom. Then we considered a racial something shared by all blacks or all whites or all yellows or all browns. In each case, people suppose that an identity that survives through time and space must be propelled by some common potent content. But that's just a mistake. What was England like in the days of Chaucer, father of English literature, whom Taine wrote about, who died more than 600 years ago. Take whatever you think was distinctive of, uh, of that culture, whatever combination of customs, ideas, and things made England characteristically English in the time of Chaucer. Whatever you choose, you can't use that to distinguish Englishness now. It isn't going to work. Rather, as time rolls on, each generation inherits the label from an earlier one, and in each generation, the label comes with a legacy. But as the legacies are lost or exchanged for other treasures, the label keeps trundling on. Identities can be held together by narratives, in short, without essences. You don't get to be called English because there's an essence that the label follows. You're English because our rules determine that anyone appropriately connected to the place called England is entitled to that label. So how did North Americans get connected to the West and gain an identity as participants in something called Western culture? To answer this question, we have to recognize first that the term Western culture is surprisingly modern. It's more modern than the phonograph. Indeed, the very idea of the West, to name a heritage and an object of study, doesn't really emerge until the 1890s, during a heated era of imperialism, and gains broad currency only in the, in the 20th century. When, around the time of the First World War, Oswald Spengler wrote the influential book translated as The Decline of the West, a book that introduced many readers to the idea of the West, he scoffed at the notion that there were continuities between Western culture and the classical world. If the notion of Christendom was an artifact of a prolonged military struggle against Muslim forces, our modern concept of Western culture largely took its shape during the Cold War. In the heat of battle, we forged a great narrative about Athenian democracy, the Magna Carta, the Copernican Revolution, and so on. Plato to NATO, as we say. Western culture was, as its core, individualistic and democratic and liberty-minded and tolerant and progressive and rational and scientific. Never mind that pre-modern Europe was none of these things, and that until the past century, democracy was the exception in Europe, something that few stalwarts of Western thought had anything good to say about. 
The idea that tolerance was constitutive of something called Western culture would have surprised Edward Burnett Tyler, who as a Quaker had been barred from attending England's great universities, as of course Catholics and Jews were until the 1870s, uh, along with Quakers, along with anyone who wasn't an Episcopalian. To be blunt, if Western culture were real, we wouldn't spend so much time talking it up. And once Western culture could be a term of praise, it was bound to become a term of dispraise too. Critics of Western culture producing a photo negative emphasizing slavery, subjugation, racism, militarism, and genocide, but committed to the very same essentialism, even if their nugget was made not of gold, but of arsenic. Talk of Western culture has had a larger implausibility to overcome. It places at the heart of identity all manner of exalted intellectual and artistic achievements, philosophy, literature, art, music, the things Arnold prized in humanist study. But if Western culture was there in, uh, in Troyes in the late 12th century when Chrétien de Troyes was alive, it had little to do with the lives of most of his fellow citizens who didn't know Latin or Greek and had never heard of Plato. Today in, our, in the United States, the classical heritage plays no great role in the everyday lives of most Americans. What holds a nation together, surely, is Tyler's broad sense of culture. Our customs of dress and greeting, the habits of behavior that shape relations between men and women, parents and children, cops and civilians, shop assistants and consumers. Intellectuals like me have a tendency to suppose that the things we care about are the most important things. I don't say they don't matter, but they matter less than the story of the Golden Nugget suggests. And in any way, in any case, the story is nonsense. Spain, in the heart of the West, resisted liberal democracy for two generations after it took off in India and Japan in the East, the home of Oriental despotism. Jefferson's cultural inheritance, Athenian liberty, Anglo-Saxon freedom, did not stop the United States from developing a slave republic. Franz Kafka and Miles Davis can live together as easily, perhaps even more easily, than Kafka and his fellow Austro-Hungarian Johann Strauss. You will find hip-hop in the streets of Tokyo. So once we abandon this story, we can take up a more cosmopolitan picture in which every element of culture, from philosophy or cuisine to the style of bodily movement, is separable in principle from all the others. You really can talk and walk like my friend Cornel West and think with Matthew Arnold and Immanuel Kant, as he does, as well as with Martin Luther King and Miles Davis, as he does as well. The stories we tell that connect Plato or Aristotle or Cicero or St. Augustine to contemporary American or Italian culture have some truth in them, of course. There are self-conscious traditions of scholarship and argumentation and creativity. The delusion is to think that it suffices that we have access to these values because they belong to us as if they are tracks in a library of tapes, though we've never listened to them. If these thinkers are part of our Arnoldian culture, there's no guarantee that what is best in them will continue to mean something to the children of those who now look back to them any more than the centrality of Aristotle to Muslim thought for hundreds of years guarantees him an important place in Muslim cultures today. Values are not a birthright. You need to keep caring about them. Living in the West, however you define it, being Western provides no guarantee that you will care about Western civilization. The values European humanists like to espouse belong just as easy, easily to an African or an Asian who takes them up with enthusiasm as to a European. And by that very logic, they don't belong to a European who hasn't taken the trouble to understand and absorb them. The same is true naturally in the other direction. The story of the Golden Nugget suggests we can't help caring about the traditions of the West because they are ours. In fact, the opposite is true. They are ours only if we care about them. A culture of liberty, tolerance, and rational inquiry, that would be a good idea, but these values represent choices to make, not tracks laid down by a Western destiny. We live with seven billion fellow humans on a small warming planet. The cosmopolitan impulse that draws on our common humanity is no longer a luxury, it has become a necessity. And in encapsulating that creed, I want to draw on someone who's actually a frequent presence in Western Civ courses, the dramatist Terence, a slave from Roman Africa, a Latin interpreter of Greek comedies, a writer from classical Europe who called himself Terence the African. I don't think, in other words, that I can make the point better 
than Publius Terentius Affair, writing more than two millennia ago. Homo sum, humani nihil a me alienum puto. I am human, I think nothing human alien to me. That's an identity worth holding on to. Thanks. Okay, my question goes back to the beginning. Um, you spoke about a liberal state. Um, it's kind of a basic question, but do you believe there is such a thing as a liberal state currently, or that any state has the potential to be a true liberal state? I'm going to, as it were, generalize the strategy of what I've already said by saying that um, people try to give liberalism a kind of essence. They try to tell a story about that already it was there in John Locke or, or in the Spanish liberals in the early 19th century who were the first people to use the word liberalis. Um, but I think of the history of liberalism as a history of a set of arguments, not really as a history of agreements. And the arguments center on a bunch of things. Uh, one set of arguments is about rights. Uh, what, what, and within the broadly speaking liberal tradition, I think the arguments are about what the rights are, if there are any. And the great founding historical moments of um, liberal constitution making in the French and American revolutions um, uh, are attempts to, uh, both of them have at their center, in the case of the French, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, and in the case of the uh, United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights. So I think, but, but what's in there and is it really important? That's one of the things that liberals argue about over the long haul. Second thing, uh, but, and this is a thing that develops later and is very big in the 20th century, uh, is a set of, um, of arguments about um, social provision. What do we do about people who, who can't work or, or, or are sick and, can't, uh, and don't have any money? Uh, what do we do about educating people whose parents can't afford to educate them? And that goes with, obviously, the rise of a vast liberal state that, that does public education, uh, health, social welfare provision, pensions, and so on. And that also is a, there's a big argument about how much that, of that should, there should be. Uh, if you come from the United States, you know that uh, there's a bunch of people who seem to think that it should be as small as possible. Um, but even the people who want to sort of cut it down don't want to cut it back to where it was in 1850. Um, so I think that I think of the liberal tradition as being arguments about rights and arguments about social, basic social provision. So I can't say what it would be to perfectly embody that because we'd have to settle the arguments first. And I have a view about all those arguments. But I think that um, yes, it is possible to, to imagine a society which takes seriously the idea of individual rights and also takes seriously social provision of a sort that means that, uh, here's a kind of suggestion for a, for a slogan, everybody has the chance at a life of dignity. Every, every human being in, in, in the society has a chance of that. And then as liberals think about the world as a whole, we want the world to consist of societies in all of which it's possible for people to lead a life of dignity, understanding that different societies will understand that in somewhat different ways. But supposing through the process of debate and legislation that the United Nations started with the, um, with the, the Charter of the Declaration of Human Rights, and then with the legislation that went place under that, the, the, the international covenants on civil and political rights and social and economic rights, um, through that global argument to kind of define what the minimum is, what the things are that every society must provide its people in order that they should be able to live lives of dignity, but understanding that there will be societies which are like Pakistan, uh, you know, mostly Muslim, and which will have different views about some things from other societies. So yes, I think it's possible. I think it'll produce different societies. I don't think it produce one, there's not one way to, to do these things. And that's in part, as I say, because we're trying to figure out what the content is of the rights we should have and of the social provision that we should make, uh, while at the same time trying to implement it. Um, you've taken a firm stance in the idea that um, identity and race um, are social constructs and they're deadly divisions between people but they're still important social constructs nonetheless. So how do those who are demonized by race or by colorism then combat this right. kind of Good. separation? 
So I mentioned uh, Leiden and Du Bois as examples of two, uh, two African-American uh, intellectuals who were very important in the development of uh, ideas about these things in Africa as well as in the diaspora. And they took up the idea of race and used it uh, as, a, as a positive force for resisting uh, racism, uh, both in its colonial form in Africa and in its Jim Crow form in the United States. Um, so um, why is it important, if you're going to do that, to recognize the truth in what I'm saying? Because if I'm right, then the solidarities you need in order to resist racism have to be built. They're not just there waiting in, an, in a Negro geist. You have to work. It takes work to build the kind of solidarity that you need to resist racism. And uh, Du Bois, uh, at least, who lived longer and later than Blyden, I think saw this, saw this clearly some of the time. <laughs> Uh, sometimes he didn't see it. But uh, some of the time I think he's pretty clear and one of the reasons why even as early as the late 19th century, Du Bois lived a very long time, so he was alive. He was alive on the eve of the March on Washington, but he was also alive at the, at the time of the Congress of Berlin when Africa was partitioned. He lived over a very long period. But at his best, I think, and clearest, he saw that you needed to build these solidarities and that's why he was involved not just in Pan-Africanism, but also in the non-aligned movement because he, he understood that the kind of racism that was damaging Africa through colonialism was also damaging uh, Southeast Asia, for example, and, and Indonesia and, and so on. So he had a kind of complicated constructionist view, which allowed him to see that you needed to build different kinds of solidarity for different purposes. So if you're fighting, what, one of Du Bois's best definitions of a, he, you know, you ask him, what's, what's a Negro? He says, uh, a Negro is someone who must ride Jim Crow in Georgia. Right? That's a social understanding of what the problem is. You get to be a Negro. Uh, now, he was a proud Negro. He, was not, he wasn't repudiating Negroness. He was just giving an account of how it came to be. And once he saw that it came to be in that way, then he could uh, see how you could use it in a positive way to resist. What that means for the future is that uh, whether we need a Negro identity if we get to the point where racism, anti-black racism isn't a problem, that's up for grabs. It might be usable for some other interesting purposes. I mean, identities get mobilized for all kinds of purposes. Um, Pan-Africanism is associated not just with the decolonization and, and political movements and anti-racism in the Americas, but also with, um, with, with literary and cultural movements, with negritude uh, movement. Uh, we were talking about uh, Senghor before, before I started talking to all of you. Um, so I think, but, but if you think of it as given, you won't think there's any work to do. And then it won't work, because it, because it isn't given. I remember the first time I went outside West Africa, I went to, to Botswana. Uh, my sister was getting married there, and my father couldn't go because he couldn't go through South Africa, which was the only way to go there. And at that point, it was still apartheid, and my father wasn't allowed to go to South Africa. So I slipped through. <laughs> uh, and I remember people in Botswana kept saying to me, you know, we Africans do such and such. And I would think, well, that's interesting. We Africans don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we Africans, we don't like uh, spicy food. That's funny. You know, where I come from, it's a, it's a test of whether you're an African that you like spicy food. But they eat, you know, a lot of porridge in Botswana and it's not at all spicy. Th they said, we, we Africans believe that children belong to the, to the man, to the father. That's funny, where I grew up, children definitely belong to the mother. <laughs> and, and maybe to her brother, to the mother's brother, but certainly not to the father. I mean, for one thing, who knows who your father is? You know who your mother is, but your father, that's all a bit speculative. So anyway, uh, I mean, this is before modern genetics, of course. <laughs> um, so, so I think uh, you, you, you need to, you know, that, that particular disagreement led to an actual problem, which was that at independence, from the British, Botswana didn't have enough lawyers, and so they borrowed uh, judges from other parts of Africa, and they borrowed a Ghanaian who was their chief justice. And because he thought like me, he kept deciding custody cases in divorce in what he thought was a natural way, and the people got madder and madder because it didn't seem to them like the natural way at all. 
you have to build solidarity. You can't just assume that it's there, out there waiting. How has your personal growth as a mixed individual shaped this formation of this like philosophy that identities and race do not exist? Well, I, I, uh, I prefer to say that, that races are not biological. They're, there are racial identities, which are social things. I don't think they don't exist. Uh, but I think, the, so that's a claim about what they are, not about whether they exist. You know, everybody's views are no doubt shaped by many things. <laughs> uh, mine are no doubt in part shaped by my experience. I think, I mean, the reason I started thinking about this question were two. One is, my father was a Pan-Africanist. He went to the 1945 Pan-African Congress, um, and which was the, the one that really uh, made Pan-Africanism a real force in African politics. And the other was, I came to the United States when I was in my mid-twenties and was deeply puzzled by the way people thought about race. I had read, I'd grown up, you know, in our household we were Pan-Africanists, so I'd read Richard Wright, I'd read, I'd read James Baldwin. I, it wasn't that I didn't know this stuff, but the everydayness of it struck me as really strange. Um, I understood the, as it were, conceptually, but the, the everyday practice of race. So um, once, I, uh, you know, I got accepted into a community of African Americans, for example, in New Haven, because they knew I was part African. Well, I didn't know anything about their lives. They didn't know anything about my lives, but they accepted me. That was great. I liked it. I liked being accepted. But, um, but it was sort of puzzling to me, the practice of it, not the theory, as it were. So I got interested in thinking about it. So yes, it does. You know, does have something to do with my experience. So um, my question is in regards to uh, post-colonial societies. So do you think there's something like uh, at certain point after you decolonize, it so happens that you lose that one enemy or the sense of, oh, we are fighting the British. So it's uh, that, that you have to find some other reason for existence as a nation state. So after about... 250 years of colonial history in India, we just didn't have the kind of grounding for a nation state because they brought it. And then after the two world wars, it sort of seeped into the colonial societies. It's true in a way for what's happening in um, South Africa as well, the student movement, um, how the second and the third generation sort of loses and touch with the, the, the struggle. So you have to find new grounding for why you exist. This is similar in a certain way for Australia in the sense of their anti-immigrant sentiment and their constant fight with um, refugees and the aboriginals there. I wonder if there's a certain point in histories for post-colonial society where you feel that um, identities, or especially the, the identity of a nation state just needs to be couched in, in a new format. And for India, it became religion, and, yes. and for other societies, it became race in a different way, though. Yes. I think that's right, that um, nations... So, um, you could start with um, a, a sort of uh, civic nationalism. You could start with the idea, which I think some of the generation of independence in India had. They had, it wasn't just anti-British, it was the sense that, well, this is the Indian constitution, this is this, is this project. Uh, we are united across caste and region and language by this desire to create this democratic society governed by this shared uh, understanding, um, especially after partition. So, um, and the, the trouble with that is that it's, it's great for uh, moderately well-educated politicians, but it doesn't necessarily work very well for everybody else. Um, so Kwame Nkrumah got to be president of Ghana at independence with a massive majority in parliament, but only 17% of the population voted for him, right? Not because the others weren't allowed to vote, but because only a small proportion of the population was sort of very concerned about the fact that the British were leaving and this other lot were coming in. They didn't think it was going to make much difference, and they were right. It did not make nearly as much difference as it was promised to make. So I think you do have to figure out how to make nationalism, to make enough investment in the nation uh, for most people for it to work. And 
the anti-colonial story is a, is a great starting point. It, it's, after all, the starting point of the American <laughs> experiment. But it, um, after a while, you can't keep on with that story. And part of the task of, uh, here's something that I think Heller was sort of right about. Nations have, a, have, once you get to the scale of the nation, that form of political identity requires an imaginative investment. And so, uh, and politicians aren't going to do that. So you need writers and musicians and poets and you need, as it were, Tagore and people like that uh, to, um, and we, you know, in Nigeria, for young Nigerians, I think for a period, not now, but for a little while back, Chino Achebe and um, Buchi Amacheta and, and uh, Wally Shrenka represented a thing, but that, but that was people who finished high school, right? Uh, so you, you there is a task, in other words, for an intelligentsia, a national intelligentsia, just to figure out. Nowadays, I think using, obviously, mass media, film, television, uh, uh, radio, uh, websites, uh, to figure out a way to um, get people to make this magnificent imaginative investment that is required in order to bring, it, it happens to be more than a billion people in India, but it's the same challenge if you're 20 million on ends. You don't, you don't know everybody. You don't all speak the same home language. Um, you, some of you are Muslim, some of you are Christian, some of you are neither, and so on. Some of you are from, uh, Jains, some Sikhs. And you've got to figure out a way. And it doesn't have to be one story. That's the other thing. Everybody has to have some story that invests them in, this, in the nation. But it doesn't have to be the same story. Uh, we, we can all be invested, as long as you're willing to keep the con constitutional pact that you will you will work out your differences within, within the constitutional system. But um, I think of, going back to the, the, the issue of, um, of rights and the, and the First Amendment to the United States Constitution um, speaks of many things. One of the things it speaks of is, is freedom of religion. Why? I mean, how can this multi-religious society agree on that? Well, because everybody has their reasons. Uh, the, the Protestants have a religious reason. They believe in sovereignty of the individual conscience. Catholics are a minority, so that's a good reason to, to have a constitutional protection for free, and so are Jews and, and Muslims. So different people, and atheists especially in the United States, need constitutional protection constantly. So um, different people have different reasons for investing in freedom of uh, religious practice and, and non-establishment, but they all have reasons. And reasons strong enough that they're willing to, mostly, most of them, not some not, but most of them, to invest in the constitutional arrangements which are there to sort out what happens when different religions think differently about abortion, marriage, whatever. We, 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 but if you lose that trust, and I think, I mean, one of the worst things about Donald Trump, and I'm sure you can think of many, he's sort of accelerating a corrosion of trust in the basic in infrastructure within which we work out our disagreements. And, and I worried a little bit, I think Modi has pulled back, but there was a period when the BGP seemed to me represented a reason for Muslims to be doubtful, Indian Muslims, to be doubtful that they were properly included in the constitutional compact. He's pulled back, maybe it's, I don't know, I don't know enough about India, but, but I worry when political leaders do that. Because it's, a it's an imaginative thing, it's, it's fragile in the way imaginative things are. Fra beautiful, wonderful to participate in, but fragile in the way that, and, and, and as I say, the politicians don't make this, they use it, and somebody else has to make it. How does the idea of solidarity play with, um, fit in with the use of the N-word? So is it a word to be reclaimed, or is it something to which new meaning should be given? I think a big part of the problem of what to do with the N-word is the result of something that's relatively new. And that is the pervasive circulation of things people say in recorded form, remote from the context of their utterance. So when, to, when a young African-American uh, calls, calls somebody else my nigger, right? on his own, in his private conversation. He's not doing anything in the world beyond the, the, the conversation that he's having. And, um, and it's clear in the context to the to parties involved what's going on. Um, 
it's clear that it's a gesture of solidarity, not a gesture of uh, self-hatred and so on. And so uh, it seems, uh, but the trouble is, if that's then circulated widely in a mass mediated form, it gives currency to the idea that, well, this is just another word like any other word. Uh, that's not something you would believe if you understood what it was doing in the particular context. But if you hear it circulated around context free, as it were, and, and then you know you can say, what are they making fuss about when people use this word? When other people who don't have the guarantee of mutual trust and solidarity and understanding. Th th there, are other, uh, there are other words like this. Yid is the Yiddish word for Jew. So it doesn't start out being a, being a rude word. It starts out as being the word that Jews use in, in, uh, in Yiddish to refer to one another. Uh, a lot of uh, gay people in the 70s and 80s in New York would have referred to each other as fags. but understanding that in that context that was not a hostile thing. If, if straight strangers called them fags, they would have beat them up. So I think it's, it's a problem of, because of context and decontextualization. That doesn't, I guess what that suggests is that you should be very careful with these powerful words, uh, not to let them run free of context in that way. So I think that's an argument for not myself, for not using the N-word even for black people in much public discourse. Um, but I know other people have other views about that. And the point is, my, my sort of, I'm framing the question this way because I think that's, that's what the question is. The question is um, this, this gesture of, of um, familiarity and solidarity which can come from using a word that's negative valenced in the general conversation among people who have the shared property. That's a very, as I said, there are lots of examples of that. Uh, but in a world where things you say get circulated out of context, you can't, you don't control what happens with it. And so there's a, there's a danger with such, such words as a result of that. Given that it's not based in science, not even based in history or nationhood, why is it such a tenacious um, concept? I think I would put together an answer with two sources. One is a very basic piece of um, human cognitive psychology, which is that we are um, very prone, and this starts in, 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 ch in childhood, it starts, you know, people do this, by the time you're four, you can do this, uh, essentializing, um, taking properties, superficial properties of people and projecting the idea that all the people who look like that have some deep property, and not just people, but, um, but it certainly doesn't work with people. So that's, so that's one element, but that, and that only, but that explains only why people um, project peoplehood all over the place, and, and race is a distinctive kind of peoplehood. And the, so the second element, I think, just has to do with scientism. It just has to do with the fact that, that science has a certain prestige in our culture. So when we want to defend away something that we want to do instinctively, we kind of, as it were, blame it on reality. And reality is, must, is, is what science is supposed to be about in the, in the case of human beings, uh, biological human beings. So it's a mixture of, of a... You can discourage people from this kind of essentialization by uh, using adjectival rather than nominal, but by talking about uh, a black person rather than an African American. But, but once the society is up and running and doing it, uh, changing words around isn't going to do you much good. Uh, so if we wanted to, the thing we can do is to get, is to educate people so that they second guess their instinctive reactions. There's a nice, again, a nice piece of psychology here. Um, uh, you know, there's this experiment that shows that people are more likely to shoot. Uh, you give them a game in which you, you're a cop and you get to shoot uh, people if they, only if they threaten you. And, and if you set up a scenario in which it's exactly the same, but in one case it's a white person, in other cases it's a black person, Americans are more likely to shoot the black person on the basis of exactly the same bodily movements. But if you train cops and then put them back into the game, you can get them to do it 50-50. I mean, equally, and if it's, you know, if it's half and half. Uh, so you, we can train ourselves out of 
specific <laughs> bad habits, even though those cops are still thinking that's a black person. Uh, they, they can sort of undo the, the, the harm. I do, it's clear, look, before, let's say, 1850, uh, I mean 1750 in Europe, my countryman, or my, he would have been my countryman if he'd been born now, uh, Anton Wilhelm Amu, who was a Ghanaian who taught philosophy um, in Germany in the 18th century, he was able to do that and, and nobody thought, oh, he's a black person, he's stupid. Uh, <laughs> he, he was the rector of a university for a while. Um, and then he retired home to Ghana. Um, so I think we, we can see societies in which race thinking of this sort is not the dominant way of handling things because there have been such societies in the past. Um, so we know human beings can do without it, can function without it, and nevertheless have people of lots of different colors around as they did say in the Roman Republic. So I think um, we can imagine a future in which as a result of many changes, uh, this isn't the, the go-to category that people use. Uh, so it's a mixture of this instinct of ours, this cognitive instinct, as it were, this cognitive habit, and the social context that feeds into it. And we can't change the habit, but we can change the social context. Thank you. Thank you.